this introduction and there is Zur, uh, our remote speaker. This, the floor is yours, Ari. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm going to discuss. I'm going to discuss the the system where of tenders we have in Israel for uh, implanting uh, public transportation transportation in general. And then I'm going to focus a little more on what happens when uh, the government wants to add electric buses to the public transportation. Uh, the first part I'm going to focus on, on the way the tenders are set up. I'm going to emphasize on the economic setup because that's that's when you will make the other expertise. And then I will show how those, that setup is used to uh, introduce the electric buses. So the, the basic uh, the, the basic concept, the underlying concept of, of all these uh, of the tenders in Israel is that they, they separate the, uh, the public transportation to be between the government and the, and the operators. The government is in charge of planning. Everything that's related to planning the route. Uh, the, sorry, the government plans um, the, the route. The government plans, uh, plans the time schedules. It determines which types of buses will run each route. It determines the fares. It determines everything that's related to, to planning is done by the government. Uh, then there are private operators and they're in charge of carrying out everything that's been planned. They run all the scheduled trips. They have additional responsibilities, which I will mention in, in short uh, later on. And then they get paid by the government. The government is in charge of funding and they get paid not by uh, ridership, but by the kilometers driven. So the system creates a, a separation where the government is in charge of all risks and everything related to demand. They need to determine where they think buses need to be set up, which routes are, um, are in demand. Um, if they the, the, the um, plan bus routes that are then not uh, not utilized by ridership, then they bear the cost of that because they need to run empty buses. And the operators are in charge of all the operational aspects as in they need to buy the buses, they need to hire the drivers, they need to utilize uh, fuel consumption, they need to uh, make sure they, they meet uh, time schedules. Everything that's related to operation is then uh, the operator's responsibility. Um, so uh, the prices also have certain uh, the, the the I'm sorry the the so in in reality things are slightly more complicated. First of all, recent tenders have riders ridership incentives. So then the operators receive some sort of incentive to encourage ridership, and uh, they then bear certain amount of risk. Um, and there, there are linkage systems to the payment to cover some of the operational risks. So, so things aren't quite as clear cut as, as it would seem, but that's the basic idea where the government takes responsibility for planning and for funding and the operators are responsible for uh, implementing everything as planned. Um, and then the, the last uh, responsibility is monitoring supervision, which is again, the government responsibility. They need to monitor the operation. They see that buses are, are meeting um, performance standards, uh, not meeting time schedules, uh, picking up all, all, uh, all the ridership and all sorts of things like that. So, so they regulate the entire industry um, and that's less, less relevant to our cause. So we're not gonna discuss the supervision at all. So now, um, a minor point once we're once we're on this is is the way the, the trail of money the collect the fare collection is most of the time done by operators, but then all fares are transferred to the government and the government pays operators per kilometer. Um, what this means is first of all the government um, uh, ha actually has a system of uh, joint fares where you can pay for all operators with the same with the same ticket. Uh, they can have all sorts of third-party applications used for payment, which aren't so that the fare collection is actually done by third parties and not by operations. It makes the whole system a lot more um, um, uh, a 
the different operators are, are a lot more convenient for the right. Riders can switch from one to the other easily, and, and you can synchronize between different uh, operators. Um, now, I'm gonna, the, the structure here, okay. Uh, how, how are these tenders structured? Uh, so first of all, each, each the, the transportation services in general are, are clustered, in geographical clusters. Uh, usually metropolitan areas have separate clusters for urban service and intercity services and peripheral areas will have one cluster including uh, different types of services. Um, then a public tender is published for each cluster, which includes all the different routes and weekly schedules, a, a very detailed plan exactly what each cluster should include. Um, this opportunity is then used to replan and improve the public, uh, the, the system in the entire area, once every, every tender, which is approximately 10 years. Um, and there's an initial price per kilometer, which is set in the tender. If we're talking about uh, urban areas, it's these days around between four and a half and five dollars per kilometer. Um, so that's that's what the ten, the 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 government publishes. Then whoever the participants who want to apply for the tender prepare a work schedule and they prepare an operational plan and they prepare a business plan. These plans usually last for 12 years, although they're they're opt-outs at determined times. And if um, if service, if the level of quality of service falls below a certain level, then the government can can opt out. If, for example, more than six percent of buses are late, then then they can cancel, they can take take the service away from whoever won, but that's the basic setup is for 12 years. Um, and um, what's I think most relevant for our purposes is the financial offer. After the, the tender sets an initial price per kilometer, but then the, the participants can analyze the, the cluster they're supposed to be operating and they can either say the price is fine or they can uh, ask for a higher price Per kilometer, they say, "Well, if we think five dollars isn't enough. We want six or seven to cover all our costs." Or alternatively, they can offer an advanced payment of royalties to to buy the right to operate the cluster for that price. If they think it would be cheaper than the designated price, uh, which is usually the case, then they can offer uh, to, to pay. Uh, the payment here is made in advance, not as a as a lower price per kilometer, but as a lump sum paid up in advance. I don't know for a fact why this is done, but I assume this is in order to make the payment a uh, sunk cost so that once the operator begins working, uh, they, they don't uh, find themselves in a situation where they're losing money for, for each kilometer they perform. And then they have an incentive to not meet, uh, not to perform properly. Um, they paying in advance, whatever, Pay, whatever royalty payments they made, they've already paid and they still make money for continued operations. That's an assumed the, the idea. Um, sorry, this way. So the financial offer is, is, is key because that way the, oper the operators make their business plan and they calculate all their expected costs, um, the, the operational costs. And they determine whatever risk levels they want to take, what factors they want to uh, cover themselves for, what factors they want to, to risk. And the, the, whichever the, the financial offer um, effectively determines which, uh, how much risk they're bearing and, and everything else that they, they didn't, that's covered by the, the, that's covered by the government payment. So, so effectively the government is paying the cost of operations up to the point where the operator says, this is the risk level I am interested in, in taking upon myself. And beyond that, I want the government to pay. And they, they have already calculated all their expected costs and they've said, we want this much money and the government will pay whatever they ask for, assuming they, they win the tank. Um, a few more minor points before we continue. Um, scoring, which is also kind of important. Um, as I said, there's this financial offer, which is more than half the score. So whoever gives the best financial offer is in a good position to actually win and, uh, and, and be the designated offer in the cluster. There's about 15% given for quality of, of past experience because 
most of the time the companies um, applying for participating tenders have already existing um, um, uh, existing operations and they get scored for how the quality of the service they, they perform. If they're late often, they get a lower score. If they don't always uh, use the correct buses or if the ridership are, are unhappy, then they get a lower score. So this uh, gives uh, an advantage to better companies. Um, plus the, the government can then with various causes that they want to, uh, um, they want to advance, they can uh, add points for that. For example, uh, there was a time the government thought there was a lack of, of bus drivers. Uh, and so they said, we're gonna give extra points to operators who commit to paying more to the uh, higher salary to the drivers. Um, they can give more points for, to uh, applicants who are willing to uh, buy a larger bus fleet. Uh, they uh, were times they gave extra points for uh, installing additional ticket vending machines because they wanted uh, uh, to make payment uh, without go without paying the driver directly easier. So anytime the government wants to improve the, the level of service of public transportation in any way, they use this uh, this tender system. They give points for whatever card they want to advance, and that way they get uh, the operators to cooperate. Um, so that was, no, what, once the system is set up, what happens with electric buses? Uh, I didn't point out, the picture here is, um, as I said, there's an uh, operational plan and a business plan. So you get a huge, um, there's a, there are six folders here that you need to hand in as, to the tender. It's quite a massive uh, operation. So what happens with electric buses? Electric buses um, uh, uh, set three major challenges from our point of view. The first is financial. The cost structure is different than the buses we're used to uh, employing. The buses are more expensive. The cost of operation is different, usually cheaper. Um, so we don't exactly know what the cost will be. Uh, the second challenge is operational. Uh, but um, electric buses have, have limits. Uh, you need to charge them. You can't go beyond a certain uh, capacity. And uh, the third challenge, which is also operational, but uh, is, deserves specific uh, reference, is the infrastructure. You need a appropriate uh, parking garage with, uh, with, electrical, with a electric connection that you can use to charge um, to be 100 electric buses, that's a massive connection. And it's not always easily available. So how do the tenders deal with this issue? Uh, the tenders minimize most of the challenges um, by, uh, by move, transferring some of the responsibility to the government. Uh, first of all, what the government did, they ran pilots with small number of electric buses in existing clusters. They go to an existing operator. They ask him to run three, four, or five electric buses. They make some sort of an agreement for paying for whatever uh, costs it includes. And then they already got some um, initial uh, experience of what it's like to run electric buses. They can identify what the major challenges might be that were not foreseen. Um, get some vague idea of consumption rate in, in that specific area. Um, so, so they run these pilots to, to understand what's going on, to get some people who know what they're doing and have the, uh, the necessary knowledge. Once they've run pilots for a year or two, they start including electric buses in new tenders. So they, the tender says, in whichever cluster, you need a minimum number of electrical buses that they set. Either it could be a number or it could be a percentage. They can say 50% of your buses need to be electric, or they can say uh, that a certain number need to be electric. Um, and then the operators, when they're preparing their financial proposal, we already accommodate into that the prices that we expect we're going to need to bear for running electric buses. So once we we win the tender, we've already accommodated the additional costs to the extent that there are additional costs. Um, these days, our impression is that the cost, it's still a little bit more expensive to run electric buses, but it's um, slowly getting closer to breaking even. 
So whatever additional costs we have, because the buses are more expensive, we've already accommodated that. We, we've covered ourselves because when we made our proposal, we already um, assumed the additional costs of electric buses. Um, so effectively what happens is the additional costs are borne by the government by us giving a, a lower financial proposal, whereas the operators need to bear the responsibility of assessing these costs. And if we, if we make the wrong calculations, then that's our responsibility. If we take too great of a risk, that's our responsibility. For example, we make all sorts of assumptions about what electric buses are going to cost 10 years from now. Uh, if we're too optimistic, that's our responsibility. Um, but these are risks that we can, we can manage. We can either decide how much risk we're willing to take and the costs that we're not willing to bear ourselves, the government bears by, uh, by paying a higher, higher price. Um, the, th the last, uh, last challenge is the parking garages. So here uh, it, it varies. There are tenders. Uh, in Jerusalem, there was a very large parking garage where the, the government is already building. They built a garage with 200 parking spots and a suitable electric connection. And uh, they publish a tender. They say, if you're right operating in Jerusalem, you're going to receive 100 parking spaces and we're responsible for that. So that makes things a lot easier. Um, the other possibility, if they don't have a suitable garage that they can build, what the tender will do is they set a, a predetermined price for the garage. And they, and what they will say in the tender is assume the parking garage will cost, for example, uh, $1 million per year for a parking garage with appropriate electrical uh, connection. And if the cost is more, or less, or less, then we will uh, we will uh, either bear the additional costs, or we will um, um, if if the cost is cheaper for some reason, then we will deduct the the difference from whatever it is we need to pay you. Uh, but the more likely scenario is that if the price is higher, for example, if they said assume a million dollars and then it's uh, one point two million dollars, then besides the payment per kilometer, the government will pay the additional. Uh, $200,000 per year to cover the cost of the garage. So here the operator still has the responsibility of actually building or, or renting or finding the, this garage and, and making sure it's operational, but they don't bear the risk of, of what this garage might cost, which is sometimes hard to, uh, to estimate because there's lots of regulatory uh, um, uh, all sorts of regulations on electricity, and you need to get the the proper connection, which might not be might not be that easy. So the costs are borne by the government when they set up the tender, and that covers us financially. It still leaves us with the responsibility of actually implementing this uh, plan and, and building the proper appropriate garage. Um, so what does that what does that leave us? Uh, we, we're left uh, with the operational challenges of how. How much these? Uh, how much will it actually cost, and how much consumption will actually take us to create electric buses? So here, uh, the position we are in today is that we uh, we applied for a number of tenders. We won one of the tenders in Netanya, but we haven't actually done any operational in practice. So all we know is what planning we did. Uh, I can uh, present the way we. We prepared. We worked with uh, WSP Canada. Mr. Garrett Halkin is supposed to be presenting here today. I don't know exactly when, so he'll probably uh, explain in more detail how exactly they they do the preparation. But what they basically did, they have a uh, program that simulates the con electric consumption per trip. They can then identify the work schedule best scheduled for electric buses, and uh, then we calculate the total consumption. Um, so the simulation is uh, is um, covers uh, all sorts of factors like uh, speed and time and uh, temperature and what the bus model we're planning to use and how many and what the ridership will be like. We get a uh, a hopefully we hope a good uh, prediction of what actual consumption will be, and that allows us to to make plans for which buses we want, uh, which routes we want to be running at the electric buses we can ensure that we're not gonna run out of electricity in the middle of the day. Uh, we can uh, ensure that we have um, a, 
that our garage has the necessary capacity for charging all the buses that we have. Um, of course, financially, there are the expected costs of how much electricity we actually need. It changes very much between uh, Netanya, which is, uh, which is very flat, and Jerusalem, which is, has a very mountain terrain. Um, so all, all this is, uh, is based on these simulations that, that uh, Gary created, and this gives us a, we hope, good uh, ability to plan for what operations will actually be like. Um, as I said, we haven't actually started operating yet. We're going to be starting in January. So in a year or so, we'll probably be able to give more in maybe two years. We'll, we'll know better how this planning actually, what actually took place in, in reality. But the planning um, uh, is very, uh, very detailed and gives us a lot of information about what, uh, what we're actually going to need to do and how we're going to be running these buses. Um, of course, the costs of buses and maintenance. I didn't. Uh, I didn't mention these. These are based on on uh, prices that we get from uh, from importers. Probably they don't exactly know what maintenance prices will be either. But that's uh, again, they give. Th this is a cost that, that the importers effectively need, need to take upon themselves. They need to give us. Uh, th they give us prices for maintenance on eight or ten year uh, deals. So that's not our problem. Um, and uh, that, so that basically covers um, all the challenges I mentioned. There was the operational challenge, um, the financial challenge, um, infrastructure, um, the financial challenge. We, we're in charge of, of estimating it, but then the government bears it. Operational challenges we dealt with by using uh, this uh, simulation system by WSP. Um, and infrastructure is split between the government and the operators, depending on whether a garage or whether it exists or not. Um, so that's how uh, that's how we do it so far in Israel. And uh, that's it. And, uh, thank you, thank you all for for listening. And if anyone has questions, then yeah. Question kept asked by everyone, source of electrical power, initial source of electrical power. What is that? Where do you take this electrical power? From the electrical grid? From where? Yes, the electrical power comes from the electrical grid. Um, in Israel, yeah, we will be к электросетям изначально. Присоединяемся к электросетям. Это исходный источник энергии у нас. I don't understand what was just said. Uh, no, uh, I don't hear anything. <laughs> I, I, I didn't understand. I, I, I don't understand Russian. Um, I can add, the English question was can about you hear? Can yes, you hear it, the translation? Yeah. The question was, no. what was your, can you hear it? Can now, you now hear I, it? Now I hear, yes. I, I, heard a, I heard a question in English about where the electricity comes from. Uh, the electricity comes from the, So, what is the initial source of electrical oh, so, capacity, so that, electrical that, power uh, from so, the garages? Because so, let's say uh, the electric buses are charged the garage, then they are on the line. Uh, so, where do they get this uh, electrical capacity okay. for the road? I don't know. There are some challenges right, so, related okay, to electrical so, power. Is it renewable source of energy or nuclear energy or hydro uh, or uh, hydrocarbon energy? What is the initial sort of energy as fuel? Renewables so or nuclear no, so, energy or what? So the, the for energy, electric buses. So, mm -hmm. so so far the energy comes from the from the uh, grid from the national electric company. We only have one electric company in Israel. Um, and they're the ones who, who produce the energy and provide the capacity to the garages. Um, there are ideas being discussed of uh, building um, some sort of energy source that will be at the garages and will be run by the operators. 
so far, none of these ideas have actually been uh, implemented. They're, they're being discussed, but nothing um, practical so far. Um, the, also, uh, I, I'm not sure if that was what you're referring to, but uh, the, other, the other question could be asked is, do, the, the charging in our plans is out. But looks like electric buses are very expensive. You have got high cost because it's very fashionable. It's very in uh, to have those electrical buses, but they are very expensive to operate. Right. So they're, they're expensive. They're expensive to buy. Um, which is what I mentioned before. We, when the tenders tell us how many electric buses we need to operate, then when we make our financial plan, we include in our financial plan the cost of electric buses, which are currently approximately twice the cost of regular buses. And our financial proposal is, is made accordingly. Um, the actual operation costs, as in the cost of fuel and maintenance, is, is lower than the cost of regular buses. So that covers some of the cost, um, still not enough to make them co cost effective, but it's, it's close, it's getting there because electric buses are becoming cheaper um, from, by, by the month. So we're hoping that by, within a few years, they're gonna be cheaper to, to buy and operate too. Well, thank you very much, Ari. Once again, you confirmed that electric buses will be there with us in future, but now it's sort of experimental mode of transport, which uh, uh, maybe is not embedded into the direct and explicit uh, economic model of uh, transportation. Apart from the cases when uh, the initial source of uh, power is uh, from the renewable sources of energy, uh, from piazza elements, for example, when buses are moving on and electricity is distributed, same electricity is distributed uh, from the grid to trams and trolley buses and so on. It's like a circulation of the electricity. It's very interesting Israel experience. Unfortunately, mindful of harsh climate, many cold days, it's rather difficult for us to follow what you do. Next presentation. And core, uh, the department of transport planning of Corporation Stroy Invest Project, Stroy Invest Project. And uh, you had quite unusual experience. Uh, and there was the question, social media, uh, what would be the topic uh, for this presentation? And social media uh, users selected the topic they would like to hear. Uh, so uh, now, Ayana, uh, tell us what uh, the attendees selected in the uh, network. Last year was very interesting for us. We worked in different regions uh, and uh, we have accumulated lots of issues and topics, very interesting. We have got a lot to share with you, the experience. Uh, and so uh, south to north, uh, east to west. Uh, and we uh, asked our subscribers, our users, what was the most interesting topic? Uh, and uh, Sivastopol is the city on the Black Sea. Uh, Sivastopol was selected as a very interesting uh, city for our discussions. Uh, so I would like to start from the map. Let's start from the map. Is the map of uh, those regions of Russian Federation where we worked and about specific experience we gathered from that. What was 
in our work. First of all, I would like to mention uh, the Republic Soha Yakutia, Soha Yakut on this map. Uh, Places up north, whereby we develop documents of transport planning uh, across the areas of those republics and develop comprehensive schematics for road uh, traffic in those cities of uh, Sakayukut Republic. Uh, was very impressive for us. It was a unique experience. So Sakayukuti Republic was very interesting. Uh, uh, the population is very scarce. There is no transport availability because the population is scattered around vast areas and it's very challenging for them to move around their mobility is uh, rather impaired, especially in harsh climate, very cold. And it's uh, very uh, difficult uh, when something evolves, let's say a child falls ill, it's very different, difficult for the parents to take the child to the hospital in a rapid way and so on. Uh, so we decided to work on transport availability. We made uh, public opinion polls, uh, survey, and uh, we created the platform. A platform is helpful to identify different routes. So it was possible to pay on the same tariff, the trip, and reach regional center at least two days after. But this is very challenging for this republic. Similar problems were in Sakhalin region of uh, our federation it's maritime transport railroad transport small aviation small uh, planes and helicopters so people have what uh, choice either to uh, go by fly by plane or by ship by ferry or to use uh, motor road uh, to drive in a car people have a choice and they also want one-stop shop uh, application showing them different routes if weather changes uh, or uh, maritime uh, transport stops or whatever they might switch to other mode of transport without big financial losses uh, the ministry for transport of transport of sakai Kuti republican ministry of transport of sakhalin region is developing such a platform because it receives a lot of uh, requests from the local residents so this is a very important task for those regions and our documents are very helpful uh, and using our documents they develop those proposals mindful of uh, the local residents needs and requests another unique region is Kamchat Kamchatka province we were amazed by a comprehensive and integrated integrated system of uh, traffic the terrain reliefs uh, are very specific, very peculiar. It's very difficult to offer anything. Uh, it's necessary necessary uh, to think about new geometrical parameters for crossings, uh, accesses, uh, uh, traffic junctions uh, because of uh, very diverse uh, terrain. We worked a lot along those lines and then we'll get the feedback from Kamchatka, how useful we were with our developments. Next region is Murmansk. In Murmansk, uh, we received the request about uh, communications in the city, but there is a uh, semi-island uh, and there was a ferry going there inland uh, water transport, but uh, uh, it was uh, stopped because it was not economically efficient. And the difference in time uh, between the bus route, it's 45 minutes, and five or 10 minutes on a ferry by water, the need was there. And so into the routes and schedules that inland water transport was included, we made a test run of this route. We did feasibility study 
and uh, there are no big flows now maybe there could be some tourist access access minds mindful of the tourists who will come along to Murmansk and they will use use this inland water transport uh, but short-term perspective uh, it's run at a loss, unfortunately, this transport route, ferries and inland water tra transport. We conduct soci sociological surveys. Uh, we surveyed more than 15,000 respondents across Russia nationwide, whether they are happy with the transport availability, transport accesses, what should be done in each region. I would like to dwell on Sevastopol uh, because Sevastopol was most popular according to the results of opinion poll of our subscribers. Sevastopol is unique in the way that it has got all the modes of transport, trolley buses, buses, railroad, uh, water, maritime transport, it's all inside one city, all inside one federal entity. Our work was uh, aimed at optimization of uh, public use uh, transport mobility. It was uh, brought into three components. First, development of social regional standard, mindful of the inland water uh, inland water transport. Many regions don't give it a thought why they need this uh, uh, standalone uh, standard for a region. For Sevastopol, it was the first and very important document, the social standard of transport service of the local uh, residents uh, of Sevastopol. Uh, services. This is a very needed and very important document. First, we developed uh, uh, the uh, benchmarks of transport of uh, public use transport based on social national social standard for Sevastopol. Then we developed uh, strategies of fast track development of public transport. And then we developed uh, the uh, plans for regular uh, transportation. And of course, uh, we made awareness raising for uh, transport operators about the requirements for the rolling stock, for the infrastructure and all that. We finalize this part and then there will be a fast track stage by stage development of public transport uh, transition to new route network. And only after that, uh, the document on regular transport um, transportation system will be fully approved in Sevastopol. prerequisites for the creation of regional standard. Why was it so needed for Sevastopol in particular? Here we were comparing the indicators of uh, comfort, uh, reliability, uh, availability and affordability. In the previous document, they were sometimes contradictory, containing different figures and numbers. There are indicators in the social standard of Russian Federation uh, in the code of rules, identifying social availability of different routes and also uh, information about regional regulations and normatives for Sevastopol. And in part, those indicators are overlapping sometimes dubbing, sometimes contradicting each other. So it was necessary to create a uniform document with a group of indicators and benchmarks establishing single common standard for the city of Sevastopol. We look through all the documents, all the parameters, all the overlaps, uh, uh, what should be changed. Uh, and we came up with lots of details about the social standard. We've started with the sociological questionnaire. That's quite a standard one. The duration of the interview was 17 minutes. We asked about how much people use different means of transport, different modes, and quite a standard sampling based on zoning and districts, age, gender, uh, breakdown for different districts of the city and also 
types of activities, whether these people were uh, working, not working, etc. 82% of respondents use public transport and only 18% do not use it. Quite a standard distribution. When we used to work in a remote northern city, the distribution was uh, the opposite. Uh, only about 20% were using public transport and vice versa, 80% not using it. So it is more difficult in such areas to justify the reforms and convince uh, all the people to use the public transport. In Sevastopol, the southern city, it was uh, vice versa. People were already using the public transport and we had to improve uh, the transportation, make them more comfortable, uh, more convenient. We have already a demand and we have people who want to change things in the city. That's a profile, standard profile of our rider. It is practically uh, uh, the same as for the majority of the Russian uh, territories. Uh, um, majority of women, 87%, majority people advanced in age, 82%. Uh, and young people, uh, men, vice versa, uh, stick to their own cars versus the public transport. We tried to compare how long people spend uh, riding if they use public transport one way, 35 minutes. When coming, uh, the way to the stop bus stop uh, or tram stop takes eight additional minutes. 35 minutes is way in transit plus eight minutes uh, way to the public transport stop in all 43 minutes. And also sometime people spend waiting for their bus. How long people spend uh, if they use their own vehicle to get to the same destination? It's 30 minutes. So uh, people save only uh, 13 to 15 minutes. Also in Sevastopol, people said that they uh, are not very keen to use uh, their uh, transportation means with low flow. For them, it was not that crucial. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you've already exceeded your time limit. We've asked the people whether they are ready to swap for the public transport, and they said only if the car breaks down or their road will be inaccessible. So we've managed to cover the gray zones uh, in terms of uh, stops, public transport stops that were not available, updated the rolling stock, decreased the doubling of the route network, and we have uh, identified the unequipped stopped stops and came to with a unified num the uh, all these options have been uh, considered in the individual standard of Sevastopol. I'm sorry, but the interruptions of people with other things uh, aside from the speaker hinder the interpreter. So what we managed to fight the illegal uh, carriers there uh, together with the government of the city. We uh, designed the scheme for salary of the official bus drivers. Uh, their salaries have become more attractive and there were road traffic police raids uh, uh ghost transnadzor the state transportation surveillance body uh, raids 
so that all the illegal carriers uh, were detected. In the result of this, we practically do not have uh, illegal carriers in Sevastopol. The fight is still going on because in the suburbs of Sevastopol, uh, there still are uh, illegal carriers and they use the internet to attract uh, riders. But summing up, all the methods we devised uh, uh, were successful for the city of Sevastopol in a kind of a comprehensive approach we used. Thank you very much, Jana. Any questions? Uh, please introduce yourselves. Very low volume. The interpreter doesn't hear the uh, gentleman. Sorry, no way to interpret what uh, we cannot hear. We asked the 82% who is using public uh, transport, 18% are using their own cars. So these people who use their own cars said, uh, I will never refuse to use my car. Uh, the second option, only if the fuel will become too expensive. And uh, answer number three was, I will refuse to use my vehicle only if uh, the use of a private car will be banned in this city. So these are the 18% with whom we have to work. You probably remember the experiment when the um, public transport was uh, absolutely free of charge, but uh, the same numbers of people remained uh, uh, in the public uh, transport versus private cars. So the choice in benefit of the public transport doesn't depend on uh, money uh, or on money only. Unfortunately, not many cities are ready to use other methods as of today. Once again, the interpreter doesn't hear what is being said. We have parking lots and some of them are free of charge and taxi services are also available. So these are also possibilities, but we're not ready for such measures. We're ready to improve the quality for the 82% of those who are using public transport. I suspect the people are not using microphones when asking questions. Uh, we had a question about uh, what do you mean by increasing the quality? In various regions, it uh, is different. In, for example, regions with very hot climate, they ask for air conditioners. Uh, in other places, people ask for Wi-Fi. In places where it is, uh, uh, the climate is cold, people are asking for a heated uh, bus stops so that they do not get cold. Also, uh, in some places, uh, especially trolleybus, uh, uh, they are asking for panel indicators on the stops. Yes, it is very expensive. Uh, a lot of investment goes uh, to this uh, panel indicator, but then many more people start uh, uh, using trolleybus because they immediately uh, with this uh, um, panel indicator, they immediately see how long uh, they have to wait for the next trolleybus to come. In Sevastopol, we do have a problem that transport does not stick to the schedule. There are delays and we have to work with this uh, as a priority. And also increase the frequency of uh, buses or trolley buses. But when the network is uh, already formed, 
we are trying to improve uh, the KPIs so that the uh, buses will be clean, comfortable, uh, the drivers not using telephones uh, when driving, and they change uh, system when you can change uh, the routes uh, easily and conveniently. Thank you, Yana. Next presenter is Leonid Barashev, head of the Department of Scientific Research of Transport Infrastructure and Modeling, uh, the city of Moscow. He will tell us about the transport behavior in Moscow. Leonid, the floor is yours. Good morning, Evgeny. Good morning, dear delegates. Thank you for the possibility to present at your conference. I would like to tell you about the transport behavior of the population in continuation of sociological questionnaires uh, and also in greater detail about what we mean by transport behavior, which characteristics and features. You all know how the modeling takes place. It starts with the a road network, a route network is being described. Also, the distribution of population in various districts and zones as a separate component for transport demand model are the transport behavior or mobility of the population. And that's what I want to focus upon now, which means we use here how we can use this for modeling and which correct approaches are to be used here. So which characteristics do we consider here? Very often all sociological studies uh, are the initial data for modeling. They all uh, are used to create models, but not all of them are strictly speaking initial. Uh, initial data are the mobility of the population, what time of day do people uh, move or travel, and distribution of uh, movements for, uh, depending on the time of the day, is used for the classical four-stage models. Uh, there are also data for the control of the quality of the model, or modes of transportation, use of various modes of transport data in terms of the uh, volume or scope of uh, movements. Let's start with the initial data. How the mobility of the population look like uh, per 1,000 population for the city of Moscow, we see Uh, 1,973 uh, 1, movements per 1,000 uh, population of Moscow and 1,793 movements per 1,000 uh, population of the Moscow region. There are many movements that consist uh, of two uh, uh, sub-movements, uh, uh, first to the destination and then from the destination back home. 84% uh, of respondents uh, uh, have such uh, movements uh, per day. All these movements are connected into the chains and these chains are being fixed within the uh, study we carry out. How many chains like this and how many chains per working day? Knowing the frequency of such chains throughout the day, we can define the overall number of such movements in the city. Then we have to distribute in the right way all these movements uh, based on the time of the day, uh, destinations, and uh, come up with the correct forecast. And here there are some differences. There are models based on the uh, activity chains, 
these models can show these uh, chains without any changes. In classical models that are used most often as of today in Russia, they are four stage models, such chains, uh, the so called um, mobility or uh, coefficients are applied to such chains. And thus, we know how many uh, types of chains and at what time uh, do we have. In this case, mobility coefficients are also the initial data or part of the initial data. Next characteristic, such distribution of uh, targeted uh, movements may be seen in Moscow. Usually uh, two major groups are uh, to work in the morning and back home. Uh, the first one is in yellow and back home in blue uh, in the afternoon. Uh, then shopping, uh, visiting friends, going to the university, medical services, and some almost invisible movements, very often called other. Standard four-stage models have to divide such distributions, daily distributions, uh, into separate periods. The activity chain models may uh, reproduce such uh, complicated structure in the same algorithm and the same calculation. Hence, these data may differ a little bit in different cases. In spite of some limitations that exist in classical four stage models, the return chains that consist of two links may be reproduced in simple models with the use of a matrix. And uh, we won't lose either the goals or the numbers. Now passing over to the data from social uh, social questionnaires that may be used for calibration. We sometimes hear that such data are included into the model and we may think that they're used as initial ones, but the calibration process is as follows. Some data sources are named in detail here and uh, with the help of calculation, we can have calculation metrics. We do the calculations uh, and we see different types of mobility, different modes of transport, and we load that. And we compare these data from uh, field testing, its actual matrices uh, of the mobility transport network, location of population and objects, and also regularity in uh, transport user behaviors. That way we can see uh, volumes of uh, mobility uh, in Moscow in different uh, zones. Uh, it's matrix, aggregated assessment of the volumes of uh, mobility, central zone and different zones of Moscow, apart from the central part of Moscow and Moscow region, uh, total volumes of mobility in the first trip in the morning. We can see that out of the total volume of uh, uh, mobility in the central part of the city is 9% in Moscow, within Moscow, Ring Road, apart from uh, Moscow uh, center, it's 54% and Moscow region 37%. We can build uh, 
uh, uh, such volumes and assess total volumes of mobility between those zones for central part of Moscow, for New Moscow, for the suburbs, for other zones of Moscow, for New Moscow, for Moscow region, Moscow suburbs. These are the data we obtained via modeling, and we can um, compare them to the data of uh, public opinion uh, surveys to see how exact we were with our forecast. Another type of data, which uh, I'm sorry, but there is no more uh, time. Moderator is saying, yes, I'm almost finished. Data or the use of different transport modes uh, oftentimes are also embedded into our simulation model without uh, calculations. And uh, I uh, saw an article in mass media uh, uh, it went like, if we know already existing flow, passenger flows and we can measure them, so it will be very easy to make a forecast. But we also should have knowledge of not only about the actual flows, but to forecast if we embed into the model a uh, measured a value of a divided transport, then we won't be able to come up with a forecast for way out into the future. Uh, also, there are distributions on different layers of demand uh, uh, trips based on uh, the distance or the range uh, and the time. Uh, we do the calibration and compare those outcomes of calculation for each uh, demand layer, which provides the model with high quality. Thank you. That's it. If there are questions, I'll take them. Thank you, Leonid. Uh, is this data actual i mean how does it correlate with the last year this year mindful of the pandemic and things like that this is a very important issue you raised this is the data of 2017. Uh, this data this model does not reflect pandemic the pandemic of 2020 and i'm here to say that monitoring is a very important component of studying uh, residents' mobility, but it's more important for a forecasting and simulation model for us are the tasks uh, uh, related to forecast. Uh, all the existing and forecasting simulation models, uh, some data are not embedded, they're considered to be, uh, are embedded, they are considered to be sustainable and they're not changing, but there are the periods of a drastic slump, like amid the pandemic, and we don't know what will happen to the mobility uh, of the year 2020, will there be transformations? One way or the other, we should monitor the situations and collect and compile data amid pandemic, uh, amid hike, amid slump, uh, amid normal situations, it's important. So in future, we'll shift to very high quality forecasts. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, those volumes of mobility in passenger transport in 2017 were very good. Unfortunately, there was very big slump in 2019, very big outflows of passengers for all types of public. One hand, it's related to the fact that residents are buying uh, their own passenger cars because their incomes are growing and they uh, purchase car to give it a try to ride in a car. Apart from that, there are lots of other factors like micro mobility, for example, and the factors of redistribution of labor migrants after the pandemic. Uh, there are uh, the factors of remote work, online work, many enterprises uh, learned how to work online and now they did not fully return to offline normal operations and functioning. Uh, we don't know how it will impact the economy of uh, transportation in future and of course uh, the surveys of residents' mobility should be done on a constant basis. We should take into account seasonal fluctuations uh, and some changes uh, on a yearly basis. 
in America, in Europe, once quarterly. There are publications of parameters of the changes in the residential mobility to update the model, to calibrate the model. Unfortunately, we uh, don't have this work here. We don't have calibration tables, uh, uh, not for the country, not for the regions. Uh, uh, we need calibration uh, tables. Uh, different coefficients and deflators. Uh, yes, still we'll have this information about deflators and so on, but as to the uh, residential mobility, uh, the state doesn't take that into account for some reason, which impacts adversely the economy and the economics of uh, transportation. The other day, Dennis mentioned uh, how much uh, the average which is a wage and salary of the driver impacts uh, the uh, transportation system and residence mobility. Unfortunately, now there are no calculations that, done of that when uh, the contract, uh, contract price is calculated. This doesn't come into play, but we're fully aware, all of us, and it's crystal clear that this is the factor which uh, has a very strong bearing upon uh, transportation, upon transport, on the financial model, very strong impact upon that, really. This is absolutely necessary uh, to include what I mentioned now uh, into the final resolution of our conference, because the state uh, should assess uh, residence mobility, I don't think it will be awfully expensive. Uh, at least it will be no expensive uh, than to receive the information through via, uh, via opinion uh, polls about uh, customer satisfaction, about uh, using public transport and so on. Uh, Uh, one tender, one order plays uh, uh, 50 million worth, and so it's okay. In the fall, in autumn, we have a census nationwide, and maybe uh, it could be also added up. Census, maybe a couple of questions should be included into the questionnaire uh, about residence mobilities. Uh, Uh, okay, next presentation. Helena Nanyeva, head of development, Tom Tom, the Netherlands, uh, using two plans for transport modeling. I'm from Tom Tom company. TomTom Tom is the developer, the provider of digital transport, uh, uh, motorway, maps and different navigation applications, uh, uh, routing and digital transport data apps. Our traffic services are based on a big number of data, which we obtained from the users of our apps. traffic and uh, assess them in a qualitative way. They, we keep to very strict uh, uh, confidentiality of this information, personal information, personal geolocation of the users, but then we accumulate this information and anonymously we refer uh, these uh, two different apps. In this system, uh, we do renewals every minute uh, in real time. They are available in the format of incidents uh, such as uh, traffic jams, different delays, uh, traffic congestion, roadworks, uh, or more full format is uh, the format of full traffic whereby for each a road segment, one can see how much time is, it takes to 
pass through this segment or what is this transport speed in this segment if we don't see all the traffic flow and we can uh, figure out the what is the amount of uh, traffic and transporting cars on this site and also uh, such indicators as the speed and time of uh, pass here is a screenshot in moscow out of our internal system whereby where says congestion uh, delays here it was 47 percent traffic traffic delay at this section of moscow uh, ring road uh, and uh, in some other parts of the site it was much less this is our internal research of tra traffic situation we see separate trucks of the motor vehicles they are colored uh, differently depending on their speed that they move involvement of traffic hour uh, this layer whereby you can see a yellow uh, color situation incidents like uh, uh, traffic jams uh, and we compare this data versus the data of our colleagues who do the monitoring of planned uh, uh, stops of traffic road repairs and so on so that was because of the road works uh, in the direction of all two fifth bought away and based on machine learning we can see the further development of the situation of the traffic jam whether it will increase or decrease how much time is needed for this uh traffic jam to dissolve uh, to subside and we assess the current uh, speed of the flow versus the average historic database uh, speed of traffic flow and that way we assess uh, how severe uh, that uh, traffic jam was tom uh, tom traffic index is the ranking of city of cities depending on their traffic load this year we processed uh, an awful lot of different points uh, of data for re uh, ranking 11.5 trillion points. Uh, it was a unique situation because uh, mindful of the growth of the traffic load in the previous years, 2018 and 19, in 2020, there was a big slump in traffic use on the roads in most of the Russian cities. This is the rank of the Russian cities we can see in Moscow and St. Petersburg and Ekaterinburg scaled down their load by 5%. Just to explain what this delay is, which we uh, assess in uh, percent, it's uh, to which uh, what extent the average time and transit uh, di differs from the free flow situation when there are no obstacles for the traffic. Uh, typically it's at night when free flow happens. Novosibirsk and, and Kazan uh, didn't uh, display any loads. Traffic loads are at the level of 2019, so Novosibirsk is number two in our rating, ranking because of that bypassing St. Petersburg. Kazan is uh, different in a very uh, positive way, actually. smooth organization of works, traffic, traffic infrastructure, free of charge, uh, uh, public transport use and so on. We can see delays in the last week compared versus traffic delay in the uh, previous year and the average daily load of traffic on the roads. Now, in most of the cities, traffic uh, delays are growing vis-a-vis -vis 2019. Uh, uh, due to pandemic, most of people are using public transport or taxi cabs. Uh, uh, but now they're using uh, their own passenger cars. They think it's safer during the pandemic. Moscow is most loaded, traffic 2020. We can analyze the situation, the way it evolved. Uh, I mean, uh, lockdown started uh, uh, the earliest of all the countries. Uh, 
in Russia locked down April and May, so economic traffic activity went above uh, to the previous year level or the year outset level. Uh, so the load is on the rebound. And in Moscow, the load is high because there were many road works stopping the traffic. Uh, loads went up very briefly, similar to China towards this end. It did not fully re uh, recover its traffic activity as to the USA. It's a unique situation in US. Uh, by the absence of uh, severe lockdowns, uh, traffic uh, delays were very low on the roads. It could be attributed to the fact that a big share, a big chunk of digital companies, IT companies uh, started working online. So they fully, that fully changed the lifestyle of uh, IT specialists. Dynamics, uh, but is a comparison of Moscow versus St. Petersburg. In Moscow, the lockdown and limitations were uh, very uh, stringent, very stern. So in April, May uh, 2020, uh, there were more loads on the traffic roads in uh, St. Petersburg, Manila. Uh, now it was above Moscow in loads. Now it shows uh, uh, low. Uh, loads uh, and delays on the road. This is some secret information. So we can uh, show it to the governors or whatever. Well, it's hard to see each and every city has got their own transport traffic infrastructure. Yelena, I understand that what you're telling us about and all the people are aware of that, of course, uh, and what's behind it, but raise your hands, uh, those who use the service of Tom? No one. Who are your users? Who use your apps in Russia? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, as to data providers, uh, and of course, there are uh, navigators. Uh, and nobody is using those TomTom -tom navigators because everybody has got uh, apps on the smartphone and TomTom uh, -tom is the provider of navigational apps and navigational maps one way or the other. TomTom -tom products are embedded into your smartphones. Uh, well, but there is, there is Yandex traffic jams, one or two people. In St. Petersburg, uh, Yandex sometimes uh, uh, works in a very bad way for some reason. It wobbles, uh, uh, so there are other apps as well. Do you purchase data from Yandex? No, uh, there are logistic companies who use our applications, yes. But the... Uh... Mobile providers are the main suppliers. We already discussed yesterday, and it was explained very clearly why the mobile operators, the mobile providers' data is a kind of a myth. They can't be used for traffic planning because you make certain assessments, people some people get bonuses for this, some people not. You receive uh, some rewards, but you forecast some speed for 15, 30 minutes, etc. I understand how things work in Europe. I understand how it works in the US. And the Department of uh, Transport of the US uh, spends a lot of money uh, to maintain the website in order to collect, uh, to generate the data for the population about the traffic situation. And On the other hand, I 
do not understand fully how it works in uh, Russia. What are the Russian data or the data you use in Russia? Where are they from? In order to more or less uh, right, evaluate the speed uh, at a certain uh, part of the road, you have to see uh, the data for every third uh, vehicle. We have uh, uh, more data every fifth vehicle. And unfortunately, we have a confidentiality agreement with this company where I can't disclose the data. Um, it turned out as uh, we no, from the United States uh, uh, research that very often they receive the data from the onboard computers that are integrated uh, into the vehicles. And uh, they simply, uh, they are not buying this data, they simply use this data. All the data is being uh, transferred from practically all the vehicles uh, and it is camouflaged uh, by the idea that uh, uh, they collect the data about the equipment. Uh, what about you? Do you collect the same data? No, no, uh, but you can't disclose where do you receive the data from. Uh, only partially. For example, if you have a digital memory card in your smartphone, if it is our card, we can receive these points for positioning. We can evaluate the amount of traffic we see, and we can evaluate for each region the distribution of speed and the intensity we see in our system. Even if you take the number of tracks, we have to calculate the intensity. We multiply it by this uh, percent and understand the situation. Our data is archived and we can go back for a long time. Are you selling this data? We share this data. Uh, uh, allow me to say to move forward and then I will um, come to this topic. Yes, please, but we are already short of time. So in terms of using the data for traffic models, for traffic planning, for the analysis of the situation after introducing certain changes into infrastructure, there is a move uh, portal, uh, demo access is possible, and uh, the road statistics is um, available. Correspondence matrix, uh, you understand that this is uh, motor vehicles uh, correspondence and also the monitoring of routes in the real-time mode. And to trusted users, we um, provide access for more services. There's uh, the traffic stats uh, screenshot. You can select districts or uh, specific routes, uh, dates or time slots. And for each road segment, you will see the average mean uh, speed for a certain period. Short analysis of the Pulkovska Highway Donetsk uh, prospect uh, interception. Uh, in 2012, uh, um, two level uh, junction was launched uh, 
here in St. Petersburg, and after that, the speed uh, with which the vehicles uh, reached the airport because uh, Pulkovskaya Highway is the way to the airport in St. Petersburg uh, increased. But a few years later, the main jet moved closer to the city, uh, closer to the square of uh, victory, Blushit Pabede. Uh, there, another junction was built in order to resolve this uh, a new challenge, but the challenge came back in 2020. There's the correspondence matrix with the same access via the portal, and a new product about which Ralph Petter told you is junction analytics. Uh, in the real mode, uh, in in the real time mode, you can uh, see the situation and uh, receive all the information about the time in transit, uh, uh, how long were the queues uh, coming to the junction. All this can be used, Christian. I have a proposal taking into account all this uh, we've heard and your big data. Maybe we have to analyze the data of the sources, uh, uh, compare, for example, what Yandex provides and other sources, data sources provide from the point of view of trustworthiness, uh, their optimal uh, quality and how do different navigating systems compare? We understand that around 90% of people are now using navigators, not the rules uh, they uh, now see uh, in their heads. As of lately, I see that in uh, Moscow, Yandex now selects the main streets, maybe, this uh, has been approved uh, by uh, the government of Moscow. Some few years ago, Yandex could uh, offer you how to bypass uh, the traffic jams going uh, across the inner yards uh, of um, the residential blocks, etc. But now they don't do this. And it's the same as uh, Yandex taxi service. The drivers cannot go uh, through the yards of the residential blocks to bypass the jams because they won't be paid for such uh, driving. But I've noticed as of lately that Yandex now selects main streets. Hence, I think uh, an independent review uh, of uh, navigating systems would be very, very useful. Maybe we find something new, something interesting, and we'll understand which data can really be used as unbiased data. No microphone is used, no interpretation possible. Generally speaking, the navigators has a certain logic to them. If uh, all the vehicles will go along uh, the same street, as you say about Yandex, the throughput capacity uh, will be uh, exhausted. Uh, this is not logical. So maybe it's really the policy of the uh, city government to protect the inner yards. Uh, 
становятся жители провокаторы. А система это реагирует как бы активно. I know how these systems work. There are all kinds of uh, tricks people use uh, in order to um, in order to try and uh, lift their traffic burden from their inner yards. So our next presenter is Yuri Lazarev, uh, director of the High School of Industry Trial Civil and Road Construction of St. Petersburg Polytechnical, Director of Technical Science, uh, Doctor of Technical Sciences, sorry. So, he will tell us about the uh, education uh, of students preparing their uh, future personnel for the transportation and traffic industry. We mentioned yesterday that up to now there's no higher education institution where the specialists are prepared and educated in terms of uh, building a tram tracks or trolleybus uh, uh, tracks. The competences are forgotten, for, uh, unfortunately, yes. There is uh, the so-called tram renaissance uh, in uh, Russia and uh, all over the, in the world, but there's no speciality as a tra tram track expert. Unfortunately, people who knew how to do this are already much advanced in age, more than advanced. Or they uh, lost any hope and uh, are not ready to come back to work. Tell us, please, what are you doing at your university? Yes, please. Our moderator said a few words. I'm going to be very brief because it is uh, not a presentation, actually, but uh, an announcement to raise uh, your awareness and interest uh for most of you to come over to the meetings uh, we uh, have planned a few words why this announcement was uh, included into our round table in order for you not to have an impression that such a wonderful start of our conference when our colleagues opened the uh, lab and we saw this uh so that you won't uh, think that we've opened the lab, cut the ribbon, and that's it. Certainly within the framework of the tasks set up by our president inclusive. And uh, actually two years ago, he visited our uh, university, uh, gathered together all the directors of the higher educational institutions of St. Petersburg and uh, set up the tasks for the near future. We have to use the uh, opportunities our polytechnical has and Aside for the lab that we've opened, we've already uh, started working in essence. In particular, we're opening a new master program that is called the Economics and Traffic Planning of Ecosystems. Together with the Symmetric Company, we're going to implement this within the framework of 27.4.7 science intensive technologies and the economics of innovations in Russia. What other areas uh, of education have to be developed, uh, uh, including our university? We are going to find this out. Our goals are quite modest so that the community of the delegates of this conference would be able to share their experience, will have a platform to share this experience with the new generation. If you look at the agenda, if you have looked at the agenda, 
you must have seen that it is possible to get the uh, continuous education certificates, uh, CMEs. Uh, that's uh, um, very, very important. And the program we've started implementing is uh, really unique for us, not only because uh, a very serious, very large company has joined us uh, to implement this program, but also because uh, we've managed to mobilize inside the university. And this uh, program we plan to implement is uh, really very broad. Uh, our university and uh, two other universities of St. Petersburg. And this is really great. This is a so-called interdisciplinary approach. And the logo uh, of uh, learning throughout your life is uh, exceptionally topical for all of us. As I, I've told you about this master's program, this is meant for our children. As for us, uh, we have other programs within the framework of continuous education. And here we have to consider educational programs, maybe not very large, but exceptionally topical as of today. Those who will receive a uh, continuous education certificate for traffic uh, planning and modeling will already have uh, uh, done the first step. That's our flexible response to the employer's demand. We have to understand the modern situation. I didn't prepare this slide yesterday, but that's my response to the uh, presentation. Uh, It is very important to understand the goals uh, right for the future. And uh, while the slide is being downloaded, I will give you an example. We, um, uh, you mentioned Yandex, and uh, Yandex have already implemented digital technologies within the framework of unmanned uh, vehicle, which and they show the picture. I'm not going to show it because I'm not an author. It's a very small car that uh, uh, goes around Skolkovo in Moscow delivering the documents. And our director said that if uh, the goal of digitalization is for an unmanned car to deliver documents, this is probably not exactly right. That's why we have to set up the goals for the future in a correct way. As a reminder, for all those who are interested, it is possible to publish all these things in serious scientific journals, Russian ones and international ones. Thank you. I've tried to be as brief as possible. And thank you. We hope that we'll see your graduates among the future developers and future traffic engineers. It's not easy and it's very difficult to work with the modern generation. But other alternative for us. So next, the technical director of door not so company Irina recover, uh, increasing the speed of city passenger transport in metropolitan areas. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, but today I'd rather uh, underscore the development of documents for traffic planning. Uh, our company develops different traffic planning documents for small and large cities of Russia nationwide. 
I would like to expand upon how it's possible to enhance the quality of documents and how to make it easier for the customer to undergo the acceptance procedure. The stages of the documents development of food traffic planning are quite standard. We five different stages of developments and deadlines for them. On the average, that's how much time it uh, takes us to develop them. I would like to raise the issue about uh, putting together tender documents and putting together the terms of reference, which customer has to do, which will have a strong impact upon the quality of the document per se. And I might come up with several proposals, what could be added with, uh, into any terms of reference, irrespective of type of the document, traffic planning or the level of the city or the size of the city where designing it's necessary uh, to embed the interim uh, stages for interim acceptance uh, uh, because sometimes design uh, uh, might work for a whole uh, year and then comes back to the customer with something which customer doesn't need in the first place so there should be interim assessments we saw lots of terms of reference and typically terms of reference uh, just envisage uh, the that there should be some field uh, studies without specific stages and numerical information and also micro model and zoning micro modeling uh, and consolidation of the outcomes of the works into two informational system because always every document is uh, very cumbersome, about 200 pages plus. So it's very difficult to and misleading for the customer. So we insist that everything should be consolidated into one informational field, into one GIS, uh, geo informational system. And of course, there should be some public hearings, meetings with activists, with deputies, with urbanist movement, and so on, as to the deadlines of implementation. Uh, should be noted that no matter how small the town is, it takes a lot of time, nonetheless, at the end of the day, uh, to figure out which activities should be there, which priority should be there, to figure out what's necessary to develop, what is important, what we should admit, admit. And it's very important to make documents for large cities, but there are lots of tasks for small and medium-sized cities, which are related to the economics of the traffic system and the offer customers uh, different activities which would save their money, downsize their costs, uh, and will not be very expensive per se. There are certain elements of terms of reference which should be in all the terms of reference. Says, uh, we compiled uh, major areas uh, which we identified during our some contractors develop documents and make field studies manually or just for by 15 minutes each run. It's not right when they do this photo and video recording just by that, by 15 minutes each. But there should be sector sensors, detectors, surveillance cameras. The and surveillance camera is operated using machine method. Uh, machine uh, computation is more error-free vis-a-vis uh, manual done by human beings. Oftentimes, these questionnaires are done by internet. Uh, bicyclists from this city, uh, passenger car drivers from that city. So it's a bit misleading and rather obscure. Best type of questionnaires, uh, questionnaire should be done by uh, telephone interview over the phone. It's higher quality. And also surveys of passenger flows and the stops and along the routes, the date of uh, cellular phones operators as well. Currently, at least, uh, they are not very valid and not very applicable due to their structure and type, type of data. 
uh, geo tracks, big data analysis is possible to do in any city whereby there is GIS installed on passenger uh, transport in, uh, in uh, different cities. I would like also to highlight in different types and kinds of analysis for integrated system of uh, service uh, transport services uh, to local population those eight types uh, should be done uh, solution decisions on changing route network or amend regulated tariffs it could not be done without analysis of availability and uh, overlapping of the routes uh, yeah uh, structure of them and so on it's not only economics validation and correspondence but also from the standpoint of territorial uh tra traffic uh, and transport uh, spatial availability and here only gis will help us Micro model is the backbone of decision making it's important to have uh, a high quality uh, simulation models uh, we might discuss it maybe on the sidelines of the conference, but it seems just all together that these figures uh, uh, should be in each and every transportation model to show adequate distribution. And as to the other requirements, it's necessary to say that oftentimes we receive documents for experts examination and we see that in the models they don't show freight transport, uh, transport or public transport, of course, customer cannot uh, validate that, but sometimes that happens. Uh, we should see at least three uh, types of transport uh, in the model. Also, uh, time after time, again, we keep receiving documents and, and there are uh, simulation models. The uh, metropolitan area has 2 million uh, residents, but there is a daily model of mobility which shows 1.5 million. So mobility factor is less than one, which cannot be the case. Uh, we should verify all that and customers should validate this as well. I'm here to say that micro model is the method very enabling for assessment of local solutions and in their quality, not just uh, different changes in traffic light systems uh, in the intersections or turns or whatever, but also uh, freight uh, points uh, and uh, also transport interchange hubs. It's a good instrument to test different uh, solutions. Uh, out of all our ideas, we selected top five errors. We made those errors in the past and then we corrected them or the errors and mistakes made by our colleagues when they were in the process of development of the documents for traffic planning. For example, uh, the budget of the municipal municipality, 300 million rubles for the roads and developers in bed 1 billion per year. And this is all for the money of the municipality, not just extra funding. This is very bizarre because it's non-implementable at all. And there are incorrect priorities embedded into the ideology when we do not deal with the problem of development of public transport or um, the car accident and also the decisions are uh, taken by the developers only. And uh, let's say we back 60 or 70 kilometers in year one for the construction of new years, new roads, and there is no, not enough uh, funding for that, for example. And on the whole, I would like to say that there, there is design and process done, uh, discussion done together with the local administrations, uh, local specialists and local residents, and how to make this document really uh, workable and implementable, not to be dusted in the shelf of public officials. Uh, so we discuss it all with all the stakeholders, then there will be experts of the project by uh, 
independent uh, authorities, uh, agencies, or maybe by Association, association of traffic engineers, but that's not enough. Developers who work in the city understand a lot. They have got lots of information, so they should continue this dialogue with the municipalities. Uh, so sometimes uh, those municipal officials don't know how to work with those documents and authors control authors, authors supervision and oversight should be there. The ownership of the project should be there because we should look at the plan and to compare it vis-a-vis uh, -vis the actual situation. Uh, it should be done as well. Uh, documents and other documents are needed so that after the solution was taken on board, then we should monitor it, uh, maybe do some uh, measurements uh, to uh, be aware whether we're on the right track, whether we embedded the right information in the beginning to move to, uh, to join results. Uh, I wish my colleagues very good projects maybe we'll do some joint efforts for developments, new applications for new cities. Thank you very much, Irina. The uh, question very important for mostly most of us who are here today and for those who are here online from your standpoint, you are saying that it's needed to uh, it need, takes to do the survey, opinion polls, and all of that. What would be the minimum cost for all those surveys? Surge. This year is very special as the results of the trades in the stock exchange, uh, the drop is very big. And in the tent, there is actually, uh, everything has been changing after COVID, I can tell you that it's 15 or 20 percent out of the total cost of the contrast contract. And next, it depends on the size of the territory. But on the average, uh, like 10,000 for one point, for one point, 10,000 to one point, it's very difficult to calculate. Well, this year, uh, there are some uh, points uh, which are much more expensive. So the situation is so diverse vis-a-vis -vis the previous pre-COVID situation and the price of contract, the cost of contract is uh, very different here or different quarter per kilometer per hour and so on. So now it's uh, many things are changing. Of course, uh, everything is uh, costly. So uh, every step of the way, everything costs money. Yes, but I told you about the percentage from the total cost of the contract in small towns uh, whereby uh, it's 10,000 local residents. It's 15 uh, points of interest, maybe if it's very compact. And then it could be exponential uh, growth. Uh, if, uh, the town's uh, size is 300,000 or 400,000. It could be 50 or 60 points of intensity and points of interest in different time intervals, uh, different prices. As to passenger flows, uh, because there are different tenders now, surveys for passenger flows and planning, like 6 million, for example, for a city whereby there are only 200,000 residents. 50-50, as to surveys of passenger flow, it's almost the same, but we calculate not just uh, stops, but uh, different routes, uh, different points of interest and points of uh, intensity. So the cost of survey depends on the number of the routes uh, as well. All the key routes are always surveys when we're speaking about the standards of activities. Uh, the, we should uh, survey all the key routes and survey all the illegal and regulated tariffs of transport operators in the gray zones who those who are uh, driving uh, 
they fixed uh, tax events. So thank you very much. This is the end of our session. Now we'll take a small break. Thank you, everyone. площадкой для обсуждения вопросов транспортного моделирования. Совместное пользование, да, нажать? нажать? Да, 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 да. Так, я вот открыл, только у меня... Не, не видно, да, наверное? А, так, сейчас пока что... Не, не, видно. Смотрите, вам надо сначала открыть презентацию, а потом уже нажать в зуме демонстрации экрана. Вот так, завершите сейчас. Вы можете закрыть, да. Я, я, закрыть я закрыл, я пытаюсь открыть. Не, я все еще вижу вашу, ваше а, деление так. экрана. Thank you. 